A high performance culture increases sales. It improves profitability. It propels customer satisfaction. We know that it strengthens employee engagement and organizational unity, and it drives elite levels of performance. It has the potential to propel any organization to the top of its industry. Today on the Champion Forum podcast, we hear from Mark Miller about why culture rules. Mark Miller is a business leader. He's a best-selling author and communicator. Mark started his Chick-fil-A career working as an hourly team member in 1977 and recently retired as vice president of high-performance leadership. He began writing almost 20 years ago, and with over 1 million books in print in more than 25 languages, Mark's global impact continues to grow. In addition to his writing, Mark enjoys encouraging and equipping leaders, and over the years, he's traveled to dozens of countries, teaching for numerous international organizations. Married to Donna, his high school sweetheart of 40 years, they have two sons, Justin and David, a daughter-in-law, Lindsay, and three amazing grandchildren, Addie, Logan, and Finn. Mark, welcome to the show. Jeff, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. You bet. And I think I said that right. A uh, a recent transition from Chick-fil-A, correct? Yes. And I've I've been trying to to reframe that. I'll 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 try this on you. I'm telling folks that I'm moving into my second half. Now there you go. some some would look at me and say, you look a little bit too old to assume <laughs> that you're moving into the second half. And my response is you don't know how long I'm planning to live. So uh, I'm going to try to run up the score in the second half. Well, hey, we only get 120 max. So uh, you're probably right on it. And uh, I like your odds of making even bigger impact in the second half than the first half. How's that? Well, thanks. That's the plan. Well, I got to ask you, just by by looking at your bio, Mark, um, we can either make a couple of assumptions. One assumption would be is that uh, every day of your marriage has been sweet bliss, just like your career at Chick-fil-A. There was never a bad day, never a challenge. You just woke up excited every single day, or you have a knack uh, for pushing through the challenges, making the best out of situations. Uh, what we know is that you're loyal and you've stayed committed to things. So what's the secret sauce? Well, I think for me, it's, it's lifelong learning. Um, I was I was convinced many years ago that my capacity to grow would determine my capacity to lead. And so I I confront as many challenges as anybody else, but I see each one of them as an opportunity to learn something. I think I can grow uh, from those challenges. And that's my that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, it's it's a fantastic story that you have. And uh, we talked a little bit offline about starting from the bottom and and growing up through. And obviously, we're going to talk about your most uh, recent book. What, what an amazing book! It's going to change literally, I think, how businesses are run in our country and maybe the and for sure the world. But I would be remiss not to talk a little bit about your journey. And I know when people think Chick Fil A. Uh, They think service, they think culture, they think values, of course, they think it's my pleasure. You've been on this journey uh, a while, and you've been a key contributor of the success of the organization. However, uh, for those that even follow you, a lot of people might not know that uh, some of the early stories on when you were an hourly employee at the restaurant side and you quit, but then you went back and you were rehired. Can you tell us a little bit about that early transition sure. and, and maybe even give us a sneak peek on who conducted your first interview at the corporate office to become the 16th corporate employee? If you could share that story. Oh, I'll be glad to. I would be glad to. Yeah. Like like your kids, I had the opportunity to work at Chick-fil-A as a teenager. Unfortunately, I was awful. I I tell our restaurant operators that I hope they never have an employee as bad as I was. (laughs) And to this day, I'm just not real good with my hands. And and that was uh, on full display as I tried to prepare food and tried to do it accurately and quickly. 
And it just, it was not going good. And so fearing uh, and fully anticipating my termination each and every day, I made that strategic career decision, which I'm quick to say is not career advice. I quit. I just said it would look better on my resume to have left Chick-fil-A than have to explain for the rest of my life why I was terminated. <laughs> and so I left and I went and I got another job. And about six months later, I got laid off from that job. And I thought, shoot, I need a job. And I really can't do what they do in the restaurant, but maybe I can work at the corporate headquarters. Now, of course, that makes no sense in any universe. Uh, I just write it up to the mind of a child. I mean, this was a long, long time ago, and that made perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so I walked into the headquarters and I told the receptionist I wanted a job working in their warehouse. And she told me to have a seat. And I thought, well, that's a good sign. She didn't call security. And just a few minutes later, Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, came out and took me into his office to conduct this interview. Now, that didn't make sense to me back then. I know it doesn't make sense to your listeners. I'm thinking, why in the world is the CEO interviewing a kid to work in the warehouse? Mm. Well, I... I later learned, and you've already referenced, I was interviewing to become the 16th corporate employee. And when you've only got 15 employees, it makes perfect sense that the head man or the head woman would be conducting those interviews. Yeah. And so I tell people today, it was a combination of God's grace and lack of discernment on Truett's part that he gave me that job <laughs> in the warehouse. And that was in 1978. What an amazing story. The inventor of the chicken sandwich itself was your hiring manager. That is correct. I mean, talk about uh, hitching your wagon to the right people. And uh, obviously, a lot of people have done that for you, Mark, and you're doing that for people. But I just find it amazing because I'm a student of Chick-fil-A which is why my kids were it was mandatory to work at Chick-fil-A in high school. Uh, but to just think about like what those conversations and meetings and so forth would have been like with such a visionary leader um, in Mr. Kathy, I think is just amazing. And I surely wanted our listeners to hear that story. Now, you referenced this a little bit, but I, I heard um, I heard an interview that you were on and and you were asked once, what was the most important lesson that you learned in your career journey? And, and you went on to tell the story of one of your supervisors telling you early on that a person's capacity to grow determines their capacity to lead. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this became a hallmark of your mission? Sure. Well, here, here's the deal. And I'm, I'm, again, full intellectual integrity here. My parents wish that I had made the decision to lifelong learning earlier because I was a lousy student mm -hmm. and, and I walked into the workplace as a lousy student and it was my second supervisor, but within the first year who said, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically let me explain the way the world works. He said, if you want more influence, if you want more opportunity and you want more impact, there's only one path. Well, he had my attention, right? I'm a kid, but I'm thinking influence, opportunity, and impact, sign me up. He said, there's only one path. And he said, it's lifelong learning. And I said, is that really how the world works? And he said, that's how the world works. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was telling that story to a group not too long ago. And somebody said, well, I bet that's easy for you. And I said, well, why would you say that? And many of your listeners are probably familiar with strength finders, the, the concept that there are there is a test you can take and it tells you what you're good at. And of course, everybody loves to be told what they're good at. Mm -hmm. And I think if I recall, there are 34 strengths that have been, that have been um, quantified in this assessment. And this person said, well, lifelong learning is probably easy for you because I bet you're a learner, learner, one of those 34 potential categories. Sure. And I said, you know, no, I, I don't think learning is in my top 10. I'm not sure learning is in my top 25. Hmm. And they said, well, that's odd. I said, well, why is it odd? They said, because you act like a learner. I said, well, you didn't hear my story. I, I said, I chose to pursue lifelong learning. It, mm -hmm. it was a choice. It's still a choice. I'd rather listen to the radio 
than an audible book or a podcast. I mean, you get to decide each and every day, are you going to approach the day as a learner or not? And because I do want more influence, more opportunity, and more impact, I'm 45 years into that decision, and I'm now just trying to live to make it so. Man, it's it's so powerful, and I love hearing this from you know somebody so accomplished as yourself. And I think it encourages and inspires others that there's no secret sauce, there's no pill that you can take, there's no infusion that you can have. And and I like you, I believe that what really is a separator for most successful, influential high impact people is that they're the people that are willing to give up what they want now for what they want most. And it's to your point, it's like, I would rather listen to uh, my favorite playlist of songs than listen to an audio book. But what I love most demands that I listen to the audio book. So that's the choice that I'm making. And, and I love uh, gleaning from that. And I mean, goodness sake, we could go on for hours about your personal experiences and how we can learn from those. But I definitely want to really focus on this most recent book because it's a game changer. And you you wrote you wrote this book, Culture Rules, made the the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. No surprise. What you could have wrote about anything. You have depths of knowledge. Why did you decide to write this book and why now? Okay, well, let me link this to our previous conversation. And, and thank you for your kind words about my depth of knowledge and, and accomplishment. But every project, I feel like I'm starting from zero. And that's great because we always begin the work that we do with the question, what is universally true about this topic? I, I, can't, I can't tell you or your listeners that I have successfully removed my bias from the things I've had the opportunity to write, but I can promise you this, we never start with our bias. We start with what is universally true, which demands that each and every project and culture rules, I think is the 11th that we've done in 25 years. We always start with that search for truth. We enter these, these uh, projects as a learner, which enables us to, to hopefully add value to leaders. Mm. And on this particular project, as with many of the others, we actually begin by looking into the near-term future. And we try to anticipate what are the issues, the challenges, and the obstacles that we can see tripping up leaders in the next three to five years. Mm. Now, a couple of our projects have been current felt need, but that's, we don't like, that's reactionary. Mm -hmm. uh, and the projects of this magnitude typically take several years, sometimes longer to research, to validate, to write, to publish. And so we're trying to stay ahead. And even a couple of times we tried to look over the horizon and instead of say, where's the puck headed? We we've, we've asked ourselves, where do we want the puck to go? Yeah. But we have that future orientation. And so several years back, we were in that conversation, which it seems like we're always in that conversation, trying to figure out, you know, what we want to invest our time in energy, researching, studying, validating, and writing about. And the topic of culture emerged. Uh, we had what I would consider some weak signals. It was just coming up more and more uh, seemingly randomly in conversations. And then when you talk to leaders about issues, or problems or concerns, sometimes they wouldn't use the, the, the word culture, but you peel back one or two layers and you realize what they were talking about was a cultural issue. Yeah. And so we decided to make culture uh, a project. And this was pre-pandemic. So I would say the pandemic just put extensive pressure, massive pressure on organizational culture. Uh, so we're thankful that now coming out of it, we've got a point of view because that that pressure did one of two things. It might have done both. It either showcased some strengths. I mean, some organizations were resilient and agile and creative and collaborative. And mm -hmm. that's great. Other yeah. organizations, they saw cracks. They, they saw issues that they may not have seen previously because the pressure of the pandemic was much like putting a hose or a pipe under pressure. And even the smallest uh, breach 
will become apparent. And so again, some organizations, it was both uh, showcase some highlights and some strengths and uh, identified some weaknesses. So we're very, very thankful now to have a point of view coming out of the pandemic. Everybody wants to talk about culture right now. It's a, it's an absolute fact. And I shared with you offline before we hit record here, uh, you know, my day to day in business consulting, and I'm in the companies like you and, and you're absolutely right, Mark. It is, um, it is a, it's literally a fight, a fight for culture. And, uh, you know, as a business consultant, I mean, I was in the Fortune 500 for 24 years, and I was in an organization that had a very strong culture, um, but it was one that you had to fight for. Culture leaks. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you don't have a strong culture and it's still leaking, it only makes things worse. And I think now more than ever, culture is more compromised. And I, I don't know if you agree with that statement or not, but if you do, why would why do you think that is that right now culture is more under attack than maybe ever before? Well, let me let me point to some research that we did. Uh, I've already mentioned that we begin these projects with the question, "What is universally true?" And there are any number of ways you can discern that. Our approach was multifaceted, uh, hundreds of hours of desk research. Um, I don't know probably a hundred interviews with leaders from organizations that people would know a lot that were very, very strong cultures and others where the cultures were not strong. We talked to them as well. And then we did some quantitative work. We decided we should talk to leaders around the world. We talked to leaders and frontline associates. And we ended up with over 6,000 people in our sample. And for those in your audience that aren't statisticians, uh, the stuff you see on the evening news, they usually talk to 400 people and tell you, here's what America thinks about this or that. And we wanted a tighter margin of error. So we ended up talking to over 6,000 folks. Mm -hmm. And I'll share two stats in an attempt to answer your question. The first stat is that about 70% of leaders globally And 72% of U.S. leaders say that culture is the most powerful tool at their disposal to drive performance. Hmm. I want to let that settle for just a minute. Seven out of 10 leaders say culture is the most powerful tool at their disposal to drive performance. Now, that wasn't particularly insightful. I mean, I wouldn't have known the number, but I think a lot of leaders get the importance of culture. Yeah. But the number that got our attention was we asked those same leaders to rank their priorities, building and maintaining culture came in at number 12. Hmm. Wow. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not working on the 12th thing on my priority list. No. Culture is under fire because leaders are not intentionally focused on culture. Now, I have I have two reasons that I believe that's the case, but let me start with this is clearly a leadership opportunity. This is mm-hmm. a leadership challenge. If the leader's not working on culture, you can assume others aren't. Sure. And every organization has a culture. It's either by design or default. And the ones by default, they're they're not healthy. They're not thriving. They're not vibrant. They're not even sustainable. And so Our team went to work and said, we've got to help leaders close the knowing doing gap. They know it's important and it's number 12 on their priority list. That is amazing. I love, I'm writing this actually. You you have a culture. It's either by design or by default. And so that means everybody listening, you have one. And you talked about um, the leadership opportunity here, and I believe that that truly is what it is. And there's there's many benefits, and and maybe we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But you have leaders saying this is the most important thing, but it's twelfth on my priority list. And now you talk. Would you say then that that is the predominant culture gap today? Is that leaders are saying one thing and doing the other? Or are there other things that stand out to you? Or is this, this rises and falls on the leadership? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, 
it's the leader's opportunity and it's the leader's responsibility. The big idea from all the work is leaders animate culture. Yeah. Or not, or yeah. not. And sure. animate to breathe life into. Now, I don't and, know if the survey they do told it or us. they don't. Yeah, I don't know if the survey told us this or not, but I would love your perspective. So 6,000 people, culture is the most important thing, but it's 12th on my priority list. Why do you think leaders say culture is important, but they fail to make it a priority? Why is that? Two reasons. And one I'm going to talk about real briefly, and then the other is actually the subject of the book. We did some previous work several years ago on leadership effectiveness. And it was basically our observation that there were a lot of men and women who knew how to lead and they just weren't leading well. Mm -hmm. I've likened it to a major league pitcher who's having trouble throwing strikes. That pitcher does not need to learn how to pitch. They've already got the contract. They're on the team. They're in the major leagues, but they're not throwing enough strikes. So we went to work trying to figure out why are so many leaders struggling? We actually labeled the project um, in, in, as we began, we want to try to help leaders improve their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And what we, what we learned, what we discerned is that the reason so many leaders are struggling with effectiveness is they're trying to lead from quicksand. Quicksand, busyness, distraction, complexity, fear, fatigue. I mean, it's a toxic mix. And for individual leaders, it can be comprised of different elements. And in different seasons of your life, it can be yet a different mix. Yeah. But in our research, we discovered leaders who spent little or no time in quicksand. Yeah, And we wanted to figure out what we could learn from them so that we might share that with other leaders. But but quicks, and that's another story for another day. We wrote about that in a book called Smart Leadership. But here's the deal. Leaders in quicksand, which is a lot of leaders, mm -hmm. they're not working on culture. They're working on survival. And here's, by extension, leaders in quicksand can't help other people around them out of the quicksand because they're in it with them. Mm -hmm. And so that means those people aren't working on culture. So yeah. I think that's the number one reason that later they're, they're distracted by all these other things that are in fact impediments to their leadership effectiveness. So it's, it's, I will say this, let me say this parenthetically, unless, unless you want to go here, we actually created a free assessment for leaders. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is text be smart with no space. It's B-E-S-M-A-R-T. Text that to 66866. And it's not one of those assessments that you do and think I'll never get those 15 minutes of my life back. Uh, with credit to the team that did that work, that you'll get individual prescriptions on how to get out of quicksand based on your responses. Now, um, some of a lot of the people who are listening to this are not in quicksand. I would encourage them to pass that on to the people they know who are in quicksand. <laughs> right. and that'll give them that'll give them some tangible next steps to get out. That's yeah. the number one reason that leaders don't work on culture. Yeah. I 100% agree. This is a matter of working in the business or on the business. Uh, choose your pain. You know, the pain of building a culture or the pain of not building a culture. What we know about uh, high impact leaders is they have more to do than they have time. And so we also know that they know how valuable culture is, but they're not investing the time. And, and I do believe what you're saying. It's a pay now or pay later. And we yeah. will, uh, listener, we will put it in the show notes, everything Mark just said. So you don't have to pull the car over and write it down. Uh, I believe it's on your homepage of your website as well uh, from my uh, research, Mark. Think, so we'll put a link to be. that there. Absolutely yeah. do this. You know, part of growing as a leader is self-awareness and knowing mm -hmm. where your blind spots are. Um, and you did mention the the second thing, which yeah, I, I would love to. You know, in your book, you you have this three rule framework. And yeah. Well, the second, yeah, the, yeah. Let me let me say the second yeah. reason is the topic of culture. It's not approachable. It's not accessible. 
It's not actionable. Leaders literally said they don't know what to do. I'll give you an example of this. And I want to be real careful. I'm not really not trying to offend anybody because I know a lot of organizations, including Chick-fil-A, that has done some of these same things. And it's not for uh, lack of intent or it's just, I think it's a culture so complicated. Leaders don't know what to do. And so about 15 years ago, you may recall, there was a lot of media coverage about Google's culture. And yeah. all of the all of the stuff that you saw on TV and the news programs and the magazine articles, they all featured the fact that Google had ping pong tables. Right. And I'm, I would love to have been in the ping pong table business because <laughs> leaders all over the world bought ping pong tables. We're going to fix our culture. We're going to get ping pong tables because Google's right. got them. We got them. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a perfect illustration of leaders. They really don't know how to tackle strategically the question of culture. And so that, in essence, became what the book is about. How do we make it actionable? How do we make it approachable? Um, and I'll tell you a quick story about that. We were inspired by the Navy SEALs, and this is in the book as well. Uh, when they wanted to document their mantra a few years ago, they said they'd been moving at the speed of war, which I think is the same speed your audience has been moving at. The difference mm. is people are shooting at the SEALs and they're not shooting generally at me and you. Right. Um, but they said they wanted to document what was important for the next generation of SEALs. And the first thing they wrote down was shoot, move, and communicate shoot, move, and communicate. Now, that's not how you build a great culture. I want to be sure and clarify that. Uh, and I was with Rourke Denver, former commander of the SEALs, just a few weeks ago, and he would tell you there's a lot more you need to know than shoot, move, and communicate. But that is the first thing they wrote down because they, they said that will help you survive to fight another day. Hmm. And so our team went to work and said, what's the equivalent of shoot, move, and communicate for leaders who are trying to build culture. Hmm. And from that mental exercise, we came up with the three rules. And if you'd like, we can, uh, we can go through those at a pretty high level. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're, they're powerful. And it's funny you talk about the ping pong tables because the listener that's a frequent listener of this show knows that I always say, Mark, building a culture is not ice cream socials on Friday. Mm -hmm. By all means, have the ping pong table, have the ice cream socials. But, you know, I, I, I would also say it's like telling somebody that lacks confidence, we'll just be more confident. Mm -hmm. Somebody that lacks a culture, we'll just build a better culture. And, and your book, out, it's a roadmap, literally a roadmap for the people that say, I want it, but I don't know how to get there. Yeah. <clears throat> so the three things. Yeah. So let's real quick, I'll cover the three rules. Yeah, I think this is impactful and it and definitely it, it should propel a lot more people to break these down and review them and study them in the book. But the first rule that you talk about in implementing a high performance culture is aspire, which suggests that leaders crystallize and clarify and you talk through those things. Can you share what you mean with the first rule? Which Yeah, which absolutely. Aspire? Absolutely. You have to share your hopes and dreams for your culture. We talked to far too many leaders who couldn't do that. They couldn't do it. Um, and some would say, well, it's in my head or it's in my heart. And I'd say, that's a great place for it to start. But you can't create a culture by yourself. The culture doesn't exist until you can sufficiently share the aspiration and have others join you in making it a reality. And so you, you've got to not only be able to articulate it, the test I've been giving leaders is, is it simple? Is it clear? And is it repeatable? Because you need other people to embrace it if you've got any chance of pulling it off. Mm -hmm. And there are just far too many leaders that can't do that. So I've been asked if this is the most important of the three rules. And I said, well, they're all important. But this is first among equals, because if you can't articulate it, the chance of creating it is pretty close to zero. Yeah. And that's uh, deploying core values, setting expectations, boundaries. And, and we talked about it earlier, culture leaks. And so there has to be a top down approach to this, because uh, I think you referenced the word ambassadors. And we talk a lot about the cliche poster on the wall, 
and you don't have a good culture because the poster says you have a good culture. Uh, you don't care for people and your employees and employee engagement because the poster says that you do. And I think that is a fundamental element. I would tell you out of the three, I would definitely rank it number one, but that's it's a hard one to pick because the second one, which is Amplify, I mean, this this requires that the leaders create a compelling picture of the future, visionary. They're reinforcing it. They're celebrating their values, which, by the way, Chick-fil-A does an amazing job of that. So talk to us about this second rule of Amplify and how can uh, a leader listening or an executive listening really take this second rule and run with it? Well, you, you summarized it quite well. We, we have to always be looking for ways to reinforce the aspiration. We, we chose the word amplify for a lot of reasons. One is the fact that there's so much noise in the world, is that we actually have to get the message and intent of the aspiration above the noise. Mm -hmm. And we've got to convince people this is real, this is legit. This is not going away. This is, in fact, who we are becoming. This is what we are working to achieve and to accomplish. And there are any number of ways. I'll share a couple of really quick examples. The first is role modeling. People always watch the leader. So mm -hmm. what are they learning about your cultural aspiration and how serious you are by your own actions and your own behaviors? It's just huge, critical, critical, critical. People always watch the leader. How about storytelling? It was Plato that said, what is honored in a country is cultivated there. Hmm. What is honored is cultivated. Are you telling stories about the people in your organization who are living uh, daily examples of the pursuit of the aspiration? Mm -hmm. A few years ago, we were doing some work on execution and we ended up spending time with some of the coaches at the Clemson football program. Now, some of your audience may not be Clemson fans, but they're pretty good at execution. So we went to see what we could learn from them. And interestingly enough, we ended up in a conversation about culture. They were trying to create a culture of execution. So again, set that aside for a second. We then began to talk about strategies and tactics for creating culture. Again, this was years ago before we were ever doing this work. And they talked about the power of storytelling. And they said they had a practice of sharing a story of one of the players who is living and pursuing the values, or at least one of the values, every time the team meets. And I said, well, that sounds hard. And he said, well, which part? And I said, well, you guys meet a lot. They said, yeah, we meet a lot. I said, and you're always telling these stories. And he said, yeah. And I said, do you have enough stories? He said, we got 152 guys that are living out these values every day. Hmm. The challenge is not shortage of stories. The challenge is figuring out which ones to tell today. Mm -hmm. And he said, guess what? The more we tell the stories, the more behavior aligns with those stories. Hmm. It's, it's Plato's, what is honored in a country is cultivated there. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, can I give you one more example? Yeah, absolutely. Strategic repetition. Uh, and I included this in the book. You may recall a, a, a phone conversation, a Zoom call with a senior leader from Netflix. Mm -hmm. And he, I asked him what I thought was a simple question about how often do you talk about the culture? And he looked at me kind of funny. Like, I mean, it was like, it was a weird, I can't even recreate the moment, but it was an awkward moment. And I'm wondering, do I need to ask the question again? Did he hear me? Did he misunderstand me? And he said, so the question is, how often do I talk about the culture? And I'm thinking, yeah, you got the question. <laughs> he said, well, every day. He said, every leader at Netflix talks about the culture every day. He said, why wouldn't you? And he's like, it's, it's what's most important. Mm -hmm. Well, then I ended up with another conversation a senior leader, a CEO level, a CEO who serves in more than a hundred countries, he kind of thought the talk about it every day was lame. Hmm. I said, what do you mean? He said, I talk about it in every meeting. I hmm. said, how's that work? He said, well, if the people in the room don't connect what we're talking to, to the aspiration, he said, that's how I'll close the meeting by kind of putting a bow on it. Hmm. He said, and if what we talked about does not further the aspiration, I asked them why we just invested the time on this. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
So strategic repetition is huge. So those are just two or three ideas. There are lots of ways that you can amplify the aspiration, but that's when people are convinced that it's real. And it's the the preponderance of the evidence. It's not one thing. It's yeah. all these things. I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time as a leader amplifying an aspiration if you want it to become reality. Yeah. Well, you know, this, you, you said this earlier, Mark, is you got to live it because I find that if you're not living what you're saying, you're white noise. And, uh, you know, you're, you're just, you're just chirping the, the, the talk track and that's what right. people will feel. But if you're mm -hmm. genuinely walking it out and people see you living it, then when, whenever you're saying it, they hear it. Um, I wanted, there was two notes that I took, uh, in reading the book about amplify that I wanted your thoughts on. Sure. Because, because I think this is so important and it's like, it's never too early to start. Some people say start in onboarding. I say start in the interview process, but I think the onboarding is so, so important as it relates to amplify. How do we tie in employee onboarding in this subject of amplify? Any thoughts on this? Well, let me affirm your, your previous comment. Culture building begins in recruiting and selection. Yes. It begins in recruiting and selection. You've got to have folks that are going to be a culture ad or, or you're working against yourself. So mm -hmm. I don't want to miss that. I think your yeah. instincts are absolutely spot on there. As far as how you link it, I think that the aspiration should become the, the North Star for onboarding and orientation. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, I mean, you have, you have the perfect opportunity. I will also say that we believe that first 40 hours is the most important week in a person's career. Mm -hmm. It's when they're most impressionable. They're, they're all eyes, they're all ears. And part of what they're looking for are the gaps between what you say and what they experience. So there's a lot being learned there about your credibility, your trustworthiness, your level of leadership. Um, you yeah. know, they say kids learn whatever the number is now, 80% of all they're going to know in their life by the time they're seven. Employees learn 80% of what they're going to know in their career in that first seven days. Yeah, this is like, hey, and you've heard these these conversations, I'm sure. And if you're listening, you've heard them too, where um, you know, it's like, hey, did they give you the playbook? Yeah, I got a three ring binder. You know, having a playbook and onboarding structure is only as good as the leader that is making sure that it's being retained. And I wanted to address that because I think this Amplify is huge. And I think a lot is missed in onboarding. We're just hoping the culture just leaps onto people. Yeah. And I tell you how much is missed. I told this story in the book too. Uh, we were interviewing a CEO for the book, uh, organization over a hundred years old. Just again, if I said the name, 95% of your folks would get it. And he had just done some amazing work and led his team to refresh the vision and values of this hundred plus year old organization. And the work they had done was so compelling. I wanted to join him. I mean, he laid it out for us and it's like, man, this is fantastic. He, he protected the past and was preparing people for the future. I mean, just, it was perfect. And then he said, oh, I'm going to have to excuse myself just a few minutes early today because I'm going to go speak to a bunch of new employees. I speak to every group. And I said, fantastic. I mean, a CEO in a big organization that's going to yeah. do that, that is a really good thing. And I said, I assume you're going to share with them what you just shared with me. And he said, the thought never crossed my mind. Huh. I wanted to whack him upside the head. <laughs> so to your point, even organizations doing orientation or onboarding, which, you know, there's an administrative side and there's a culture side. We You got to do both. But even organizations that do it often are missing it, mm. are missing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they can fill out the paper, paperwork. That's one mm -hmm. thing, but what an opportunity. They are so eager to learn, to grow. They're so impressionable. Mm -hmm. It is, you ought to crush yeah. that first week. It ought to be, it ought to yeah. be the a real focus and priority. Yeah. If we hired well, we hired coachable, we hired attitude, effort, mm -hmm. and now it's we get to paint the picture on the canvas.
That's right. They're Before ready. we move on to the third, um, the third rule, which is just as important. You know, when you were talking to saying about the 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 Clemson story and and so forth, and then you, you talked about honor. The thought crossed my mind is that not only are the other other people in the organization getting to hear the story, but the leadership is saying, if you're the one speaking and telling the story, we're honoring you. Mm -hmm. And it made me think like in the church I attend, uh, it's a volunteer organization by and large, right? And we have all of these people that are doing work that um, they're not getting paid. And you know, if you've ever worked in a volunteer organization that it's, you can't, you don't fire the people, uh, you can't uh, withhold pay from them. And so what is it that you do? And the thought that came in my mind when you were telling this story, Mark, was you can either promote what you love or you can bash what you hate. And sometimes we do carry the stick and I'm not saying don't offer correction and accountability, but I wonder if we put more attention into amplifying what we love if it wouldn't become more repeatable. And I love the illustration of that with this second rule amplify. It's it's so on point. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. And and there's a lot for leaders to to learn there for sure. So tell us what tell us about the final rule, Mark. All right. So let me give a, a quick uh cautionary note as we get ready to to discuss the third rule. I want I want to guarantee something to your listeners. I will guarantee you that if you've got a clear aspiration and you amplify it well, the culture will move towards the aspiration. It's as predictable as sunrise and sunset. That's the caution. Mm -hmm. Because leaders love to get things done and we love to check things off and we love progress and we want to move on to what's next. And when leaders see the culture moving toward the aspiration, Far too many leaders will say, check, we're done. And when you when you think you're done, you're done. Because you cannot, you can't tread water with your culture. And worse than, than treading water is some leaders will try to shrink wrap their culture to protect it. And if you do, you'll suffocate it. You'll actually kill it. And so that's why the third rule is so critical. The third rule is to adapt, to always be working to enhance the culture, constantly be working to enhance the culture. So I think what I just heard you say is putting somebody through onboarding and then putting them through the uh, sign the sheet saying that you spent two days in corporate culture training, that's not adapting. Right. 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 And um, thinking about that, uh, COVID taught us this. We talked about COVID earlier and there'll be another thing after COVID and there'll be another thing after that. Always adapting. What are some ways um, like there, you have this listener right now that's saying, OK, uh, I think Jeff just threw a shot at me with the corporate culture training. Like we're doing that. How do I know how to adapt? What are some practical things the okay. listener can be doing to adapt? All right, I'm going to give you three broad categories for consideration. One, we go into depth in the book, but let me let me hit the highlights for you. I would say the first priority for a leader when you think about adapt is to identify and eliminate any toxins. Toxins are patterns of unhealthy and unproductive behavior. If you see toxins, you have to intervene. Now, if you don't, what's going to happen is those, toxin, those toxins are going to metastasize and, and they're going to kill your organization. We've got some case studies in the book where organizations don't exist because leaders either didn't intervene or, in fact, the leaders were injecting the toxins into the organization. So that's one category. Do you have any patterns of unhealthy and unproductive behavior you need to intervene? The second category is you could double down on your strengths. Let's pretend you the level of toxicity is low enough that you've got no clear and present danger. No, that doesn't mean you're done. That doesn't mean you can move on. You say, huh, okay, great. It's a good season for us to figure out how to enhance the culture. One domain is 
could we double down on strengths? In a Chick-fil-A context, it could be a restaurant operator saying, hey, our standard for service and hospitality is really high. We're going to take it higher. Or order accuracy is high. We're going to take it even higher. And if you can figure out how to do those things and sustain the gains, what you've actually done is enhanced your culture. Mm -hmm. Third and finally, and I don't hear much about this, Another way to enhance your culture is to add new capabilities. I'll give you an example because that may sound weird. You don't hear many people talking about this. About 15 years ago, a senior leader at Chick-fil-A said, I think we need to be more innovative as a people, as a culture. Now, we're no strangers to innovation. I mean, true, Kathy invented the chicken sandwich. Yeah. But if you looked at our history of innovation, it was a bit sporadic and and random and so this leader in essence expanded our aspiration and so we began to amplify this enhanced aspiration and we defined it we staffed it we funded it we built an innovation center we added a core value we did all the stuff that you would do if you're going to amplify something we took we made heroes out of people who were innovating leaders were innovating i mean every, make your list we did all this stuff and here we are 15 years later, and we're much more innovative as a culture because that was an adaptation that a leader identified is going to serve us in the future. Hmm. Probably wasn't necessary 25 years ago. Yeah. But for the next quarter century, mm -hmm. we're going to have to innovate. Yeah. Well, so especially those whenever... are the three domains. Yeah. And I think, especially when you are considered best of class. Uh, the fight is probably even harder. You're literally fighting for inches and you have to be more intentional with that. And yeah, I love the three rules and I think they're broken down so well in the book that even if you are listening right now and you're like, this is making sense, but where do I go? Uh, what is that? This, this book is the playbook. Um, now, look, there's probably some people listening, Mark, that they're like, I got it. I mean, the three rules, uh, you know, we're, we're doing great. We're doing a great job. If there, if there is a leader that's listening and they, they do have a vibrant culture, what, what should they continue to do to make sure that they don't lose it or build from it? Okay. Uh, I'm sure there are many leaders out there in your audience that have a vibrant and thriving culture. I would first say, congratulations. It didn't happen by accident. It's, yeah. it's because you and others around you led well. Don't become complacent. I would say adapt. The third rule is for you. I mean, yes, you've got to continue to amplify the aspiration, but you've got to constantly be looking for ways to enhance your culture. And if you want to adapt well, you need to listen well. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest both quantitative and qualitative listening. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what kind of listening systems and mechanisms you have in your organization, but I would encourage you to be sure you're listening on topics that are relevant to your aspiration. Let's go back to the ping pong tables. Mm -hmm. If, if fun is one of your cultural priorities, which is great. I mean, I, I know of organizations. Well, and, and you may have purchased ping pong tables or not, but Ask your people, is it fun? How fun is it? And actually, you can measure that. You can quantify that. And if you have an aspiration of fun and only 10% of the people think it is fun, mm -hmm. well, then you've got something to go work on, yeah. right? Listening informs your adaptation. Yeah. So, so listen well, uh, formally and informally, and never stop amplifying, because if you don't amplify, Nobody's going to think you're legit anyway. Man, I, I wish my wife was here with us right now. And I tell this story all the time about don't give your team and your culture something that necessarily they're not asking for. You know, I always dreamed as a kid of having this beautiful tree house and never had it. So when I became an adult and had some level of success, I said, we're going to have the most amazing tree house the neighborhood has ever seen. And so we went to build what what would you could call a small apartment in a tree. And um, sure enough, my kids, Mark, uh, they just didn't spend a lot of time in this tree house. And I was just 
beside myself, laying in bed with my wife saying, can you believe these kids? That they're not in the treehouse. Do you know if I had a treehouse like that when I was little, I would have lived in that thing. And she said, did it ever dawn on you that they never asked for a treehouse? And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> There's a valid point to this. So maybe she, people she don't want to wise. <laughs> yeah, right? And very I think wise. this listening is so, so important. And by the way, this could come down to benefits. Like I know the story about Chick-fil-A and the daycare at the corporate office and some of the ways of how that was created and why. Mm -hmm. This listening is so big because then we can we can get more more right if that's how you even want to say it. You can be more accurate and hit the bullseye more times than not if you're finding out what is it that people want. And by and large, it's not money. And I use Chick Fil A as an example of this all the time. I know my kids work there. It's not the highest paying entry level job in the city. It's not, mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. have one of the best retentions. How is this possible? I've come to find people really do love working there. There's something to this. So yeah. there's, I mean, look, even if um, for no other reason, let's just say you're listening and probably not to this show, but let's just say that you're like, yeah, whatever. I don't really care that much. There's a business case behind this retention yes. and so forth. Huge. Yes. Huge. Yes. Yes. And thriving and vibrant cultures outperform those that are not. And I want to just add one thing to what you just said. It's great to listen for what people want. And I'm, I'm all in favor of that. As it relates to culture, you've already said what the organization wants. You're trying to identify gaps in addition to what people want. Because people may or may not want a fun place to work. But if that's what you want, then, then it's incumbent on you to create that place. Mm -hmm. You could have people that really are opposed to a fun place to work. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? They get to work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Because... Leaders are the ones that that articulate the aspiration. Mm -hmm. And so we we don't need to miss that in the midst of finding out what people want and don't want and what they value and what they don't value, because mm -hmm. that is critical as it relates to employee value propositions. Yeah. But as it relates to culture, if you want a collaborative culture, then you've got you can measure and say, huh, we're not doing real well on that. What do we need to do better? What do we need yeah. to do differently so that people will see us as a more collaborative workplace? Yeah. Yeah, it it is. Collaborative is the key word there. And mm -hmm. I love how you're challenging the listener today, Mark, too, with some of the things you're talking about. You know, you mentioned the tox, the toxins. And and we we started by talking about why is culture under such attack? And I believe one of the things is the labor, getting talented labor has never been more challenging. Keeping your top talent has never been more challenging. And I got one of my best performing people. And guess what? They're toxic. So I do, I turned a blind eye to that because replacing them in this labor market would be nearly impossible. And leaders mm -hmm. are really tasked with this right now. And you're hearing from somebody that has made his life out of contributing to arguably one of the greatest corporate cultures in, our, in America, maybe in the world. We have to take this to heart because if not, you may win the battle, but ultimately you will lose the war. And you're obviously reinforcing that. Yeah. Yeah. On that specific example, I think uh, what leaders sometimes don't consider is the cost to their personal leadership. Mm -hmm. Because when we allow a toxic person to, to stay that way, because, you know, you, you want to help them be successful. You want to change their heart and mind and make them a value adding contributing member of the team. But if they are unable or unwilling and we tolerate that, we are destroying our leadership in the hearts and minds of everyone else. They're mm -hmm. either thinking you're clueless, you're a coward. They don't, they don't know. They're going to put some kind of label on you, but it's not going to be great boss because <laughs> yeah. they're having to carry the load from the person that's not carrying the load. And if you're not careful, you'll breed more of those same behavior because people will go, hey, I guess it doesn't matter. We can be late or we can be sloppy or we can make errors because they're letting this person do it. So why am I trying so hard? I mean, there is just a cascade of unintended negative consequences when leaders don't make the hard decisions. So I appreciate you bringing up that specific example. And that's just one type of toxin. But leaders yeah. have to intervene when they see patterns of unhealthy and unproductive behavior. 
It's so true. And it, this is the choose your hard moments. You know, are you going to mm -hmm. sacrifice the results short term for the long term culture? And, and Mark, this book, it's a it's a gift to our generation, quite frankly. Um, Thank look, you. Before we close, do you have time for just a couple speed round questions? Yeah, let's try it. I think this will give the listener a little bit of a view into who you are more than what you've done. What what book has made the biggest impact on your life? Yeah, that's really tricky. I mean, I'll try to answer your question. I know this is the speed round. Um, but, you know, there's so many good, passes. OK, <laughs> no, 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 no. There are so many. Again, it, it's it's often topical, you know, depending on what topic. But I would say the effective executive made a huge impact on me. And for the audience members that aren't familiar with that, it's about a 60 year old book, but they're still using it in colleges and universities around the world. As far as I know, I know in America, and it was the inspiration for smart leadership because I wanted to do something uh, more modern, but it is, it is the quintessential one of the early leadership books, Peter Drucker was a pioneer in management and leadership mm -hmm. thinking. Sure. So that, that book marked me early and often. Wow. We'll put that in the show notes for the listener okay. too, so that you can maybe go check that out. Yeah. Mark, if you had one billboard that you could put anything on it and the whole world would see it, what quote would you put on that billboard? Above all else, guard your heart hmm. for everything you do flows from it. Powerful. For those that don't know, that's Proverbs 423. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I was asked the last time I was asked a similar question. It was what was the best leadership advice you've ever received? Mm -hmm. And that's it. If your heart's not right, nobody cares about your skills. Mm -hmm. And you got too many leaders that are that are over indexing on skills and mm -hmm. they need to work on their heart. Yes. This is the, uh, you can teach what you know, but you'll reproduce who you are. Mm -hmm. Heart repro is reproducible for sure. I love that. What What's your favorite question to ask people that you admire and look up to? Goodness, I, I've got a bunch of questions. Um, wrote a whole chapter on questions in smart leadership. Love questions. My favorite question Again, it's it's context dependent, mm -hmm. but I like to know, and I've asked this question many, many times, what books have had the greatest impact on your life? Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, people will give you three or four titles and you mm -hmm. ask that of a bunch of leaders and you got a pretty good reading list. Mm -hmm. You know, what's uh, what amazing books? about that? Yes. I, Cause I asked you the question, what's the book that's had the biggest impact? you start finding that there's some common threads that mm -hmm. most successful people run in the same lanes. So if you're asking this question a lot, you can minimize your productivity of what books are you going to read? So I love it. Any daily disciplines that have changed your life? Well, I would say reviewing my personal plan on a daily basis has been really good for me. I've been doing a personal development plan for at least 30 years and always trying to make it better. What I have learned about me is the, the only, the greatest contributing factor to the impact my plan has on my life is how often I review it. Mm -hmm. And so a friend of mine challenged me. He said, look, he said, if you think about an NFL coach, they may have a playbook that's this thick, but they have a one page with all the plays on it. And so no matter how voluminous my annual plan may be, I always create a one page summary of my plan with key strategies and tactics. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I have been working in earnest to review that every day. And what I've realized is I execute a lot more of my plan. 
because yeah. I review that every day. It helps, it helps recenter me, reground me, keeps me focused. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a good discipline for me. A great way to be personally accountable as well. Yeah. Talks cheap, right? So if it's in front of you every day, I love that. Mark, anything else that um, I should have asked that I didn't, or that you would like the listener to know, or. Well, he here's what I'd love to do. Uh, I want to give everybody my phone number because they may have questions. And so they can reach me at 678-612-8441. Wow. And I'm assuming you can put that in the show notes. Yeah. And my personal email is mark at leadeveryday.com. Hmm. And what I'd love to do, if, if I can, is have about 90 seconds to tell a quick closing story. Please do. Uh if, if perchance you, you get a copy of Culture Rules, you don't need to read the epilogue because I'm going to tell you right now what's in the epilogue of the book because I think it's a great way to close this conversation. Some of you have seen the Steven Spielberg movie, Ready Player One, or you've read Ernest Cline's novel by the same name. And don't worry if you've not, I'm not going to say anything that would require a spoiler alert. But I want to set up a little scenario that explains the story so that I can share a closing thought. The story takes place in two worlds simultaneously, the real world and an online virtual world called the Oasis. And the hero of the story is named Wade in the real world, Parsival in the Oasis, with a nod to um, his namesake from King Arthur, the knight who sat around King Arthur's round table, who was in search of the Holy Grail. And so somebody asked Wade, like, what is the allure of the oasis? And he said, it's really simple. He said, people go there for what they can do, and they stay there because of who they can become. And I believe it's not appropriate for me to have an aspiration for the, the cultures represented in this audience, but I actually do. I believe you can create a culture that is life-giving, soul-enriching, and performance-enhancing, that creates such a reputation in the world that people will come there for what they can do. Yeah, They'll come for a job. Mm -hmm. And then once they discover what you've built, they might just stay because of who they can become. Yeah. I mean, that's my story. I went to Chick-fil-A almost 45 years ago because of what I could do there. Mm -hmm. And I stayed because of who I might become. Mm. It's powerful. Powerful. And we all that are listening to this show have the ability and the capability to build that same culture in our own company so that we're not just driving business results, but we're literally transforming lives. That's I a good, it. that's a win-win right there. That is a win-win. Yeah. Mark, your, your time is so valuable to us. Thank you for this gift uh, the, and, the, and continuing to give us the gifts of your knowledge and, and doing it in ways that we can consume it. We'll be sure to have links to the book, links to your website, uh, but listener, get the book, Culture Rules. Make sure to go review our show notes. This will tell you how to best follow Mark uh, to consume his content and really make this uh, one of these books that you don't just read to check the box, but you do it to internalize because it's an unbelievable message that will not only drive your business results, but give you a, a leadership legacy. So I hope this book challenges you. And until next week, keep fighting for your culture and keep turning the pressure into potential.